Having briefly discussed epistemology, theories of knowledge, and the context in which philosophers think about these and the questions that they ask, we want to turn our attention now specifically to Plato and the Theotetus. I'll start off with a very, very brief biography of Plato. I'll make some asides about the historical accuracy of the standard picture that people are often given of ancient Greece and of Plato. Then we'll turn our attention to some background and context on both the Theotetus and Plato's philosophy generally. We'll talk about how in the Theotetus, Plato is trying to create a view that is in opposition both to epistemic relativism and to skepticism. In order to see how he tries to do that, we'll talk a little bit about Plato's general theory about the nature of forms and how that uh, manifests itself in his theory about perception and the Theotetus. Then we'll turn to the first of the candidate theories of knowledge that are offered up in the dialogue, ultimately to be rejected. That first view is that to perceive is simply to know. So Plato lived from about 427 BCE until about 347 BCE. He was born during the Greek golden age or the classical era from the 5th to the 4th centuries BCE, the end of the 4th centuries. He was born into an aristocratic family. It was a wealthy family. And there were several prominent politicians on the anti-democratic side within that family. When the democratic forces under Pericles came to dominate Athenian politics, Plato's family lost much of their political influence and prospects. Plato was closely associated with Socrates in the last few years of Socrates' life, which ended when Plato was about 31. Now, you might be wondering, why am I using Pluto? Why am I using Mickey Mouse? Am I just trying to get Disney mad at me? No, it's that we oftentimes have this very cartoonish understanding of Greece during the Golden Era, and of Plato himself. The Greeks, in fact, never actually referred to themselves as Greeks. They still don't, in fact. They referred to themselves as Hellas, after Helen, which was their mythical male progenitor, the one that they thought started their race. Additionally, to be Greek wasn't to be in the particular area that we now associate with Greece. In fact, most of the pre-Socratic philosophers that we know about were outside of mainland Greece, not just on the islands, but on the Ionian Peninsula, in Egypt, over on the Sicilian island, and so on. Right? So we have a sort of inaccurate or cartoonish understanding of ancient Greece. And I just want to point that out. If you want to get a quick primer I believe the Khan Academy has a video that is an overview of classical Greece, which is reasonably good and pretty quick. Now, by some estimates, Plato began writing his dialogues during Socrates' life. But most of the evidence seems to suggest that he began writing sometimes after, sometime afterwards, maybe even 15 years or so after Socrates' death which dialogues got written in which order, which dialogues are actually authentic, is a matter of some debate in scholarly circles. The orthodox chronology based on stylometry, that is the study of the style of the dialogues, secondary source references to the dialogues and when those references occurred, and so on, right? That chronology includes the Euthypro, the Pythagoras, the Meno, the Cradlist, as written early. These were followed by the dialogues of the Middle Period, the Phaedo, the Republic, the Phaedrus, and the Symposium. And finally, we have the Paramenides 
and the Theotetus, probably in that order, followed by the Sophists, the state, Statesmen, and the Philebus as late dialogues. Let's get some background on the Theotetus itself. In the Theotetus, as well as in the Phaedo, the Republic, and the Meno, we see the beginnings of what ultimately becomes the contemporary framework for a theory of knowledge as justified true belief. This view of knowledge is held pretty much simpliciter uh, until really midway through, maybe even later in the 20th century, when in 1963, Edmund Gettier really rediscovered some counterexamples that have been written about by uh, Bertrand Russell and wrote this famous article suggesting that these conditions, being a justified true belief, were in fact not jointly sufficient, though possibly necessary, for coming to know something. Plato doesn't actually forward that contemporary definition at all. In fact, he never uses the Greek word for belief. Our translation in the copy of the Theotetus that I linked to uh, doesn't actually use the word belief, it uses the word opinion. Right? And Plato actually considers the view that knowledge is not really even true opinion. Meta logo alethe doxa. Uh, a good translation of that would probably be judgment as opposed to opinion, together with an account, logo. So, ultimately, the view that Plato forwards isn't a view that knowledge is justified true belief. The view that Plato forwards is a view that perceptual knowledge is judgment based on a systematic account of what makes something an instance or the essen essential nature of that thing. In this dialogue, he'll present three different candidates for logos. And he'll conclude at the end that the definition itself may be circular, so he doesn't draw any strong conclusions. He ultimately says, well, we've made progress, but it's kind of unclear, nonspecific, what exactly our progress has actually been. There's one other thing that we ought to note here. The idea that Plato articulates this view that knowledge is justified true belief, or even the slightly less tendentious view that knowledge is true opinion together with an account, that has to come with a pretty large caveat or warning. Because this phrase, true opinion, it also proves misleading and that the knowledge that Plato discusses is really a knowledge of categories. And so while technically these are opinions, these are really right, judgments that we make about perceptual categorization based on our knowledge of the category, the kind, the concept. And so it's not strictly speaking a knowledge of propositions, it's not strictly speaking an opinion that we're talking about in the context of the dialogue. So we'll pick up looking at that next time.